neighborhoods, in our city, in our nation, but it's not by might, and it's not by power, but by, by the Holy Spirit. And so Lord, we say by your spirit, would you come, would you humble us where we are, Lord God? Would you, would you build us and would you mold us into the image of Christ? And God, we glorify you today. We acknowledge you as the one true living God. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, Mighty God. It is who you are, oh God. We acknowledge you in this place, oh God. We enter your gates with thanksgiving and we enter your courts with praise. We say, God, you are worthy and you are holy, mighty and wonderful God. And there is no one in heaven or earth that is like you. Lord, we exalt you in this place. Be glorified, Lord Jesus. Be glorified, oh God. Lord, we say be enthroned upon the praises of your people right now, oh God. We say come in and have it, the praise. Come in and have it, your praise, oh God. You are the only one found worthy. You are the only one found worthy. Hey. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. We honor you, oh God.
and blow. Come on, let it cry out. Let it rise. Let it rise. Come on. Come and do what only let this be the cry of our hearts. Come on. Come and blow. On through Fresh fire, Lord. Fresh wind, oh God.
King Jesus. King Jesus. Come on, every voice. Come on, one voice, one accord. The name above every name. Come on. You're the glory. Shake it up. Shaking up the oh, revival. Revival. Oh. We want to see your kingdom. Oh, we want to see heaven and earth, oh God. Come on. I can't hear you. Come on. Oh, let the heavens hear your glory. Join with the heaven. We want to see it. Oh, we want to see it. We want to see it. We want to see it right now. Oh, God. Come on.
He will draw all people. I just want to lift up our voices in this place. Come on, lift up your voice right now. There is breakthrough in releasing a sound. Come on. You're the name we're lifting high, your glory shaking up the earth and skies with I hope. Come on, lift up your voice, lift up your voice. King.
spirit break out Break our walls down Spirit break out Let heaven come down Oh heaven come your fire, fire, fire. Oh, Holy Spirit, break out, break out, break out. Oh, we need you, Lord. Release your fire, fire, fire. Oh, Holy Spirit, break out, break out, break out. Oh, God, release your fire. God, we need your fire, fire, fire. God, we need your fire, fire, fire. Oh, burn us, Lord. God, we need your fire, fire, fire. Burn us, Lord. my heart 
This is your house, God. Your dwelling place. We'd rather be in your house than a thousand elsewhere. We love your presence. We love your name. love your name, Jesus. We love your name. Come on, let's sing the name of Jesus. Sing it out wherever you are, whichever way you want to do.
is healing in the name of Jesus. There is deliverance. There is salvation. So step forth in faith. Reach out your hand and call on the name of Jesus. Jesus. He will turn around. Jesus. Just call on the name of Jesus. I want to be happy here. Who's happy? Turn to somebody and say, I'm happy. I'm not sure about you. <laughs> Shane, I'm happy. Are you okay? You okay? <laughs> I want to sing Jesus one more time, yeah? Just Jesus. worship team. Can we give them a big God bless you? <laughs> Praise God. You know, when we sing or like when we sing the name of Jesus and especially like when I think about like this particular song, I don't know if you guys do this, but for me I often, like, I see husbands do this, okay? So, you know, like, um, when a wi wife is carrying some bags and stuff like that and the husband turns up, we automatically just hand over the bags to the, to the, the spouse, isn't it? 
Anyone know what I'm talking about? It's not like, will you carry this? We just hand it over and we say, bless you. Right? Wives, am I right? I mean, they have their jobs. <laughs> so I was out with Priscilla on, on Friday, okay? And Priscilla, uh, we went, uh, to picked up a few stuff, and I was carrying, I, I bought some stuff, and I was carrying the bag. And Priscilla's like, I'll take it from you, and she's carrying this bag. I said, no, no, you don't need to, I'll carry it. And then she calls Nithin, and Nithin turns up the minute, it wasn't even a 10-second gap fill. The minute Nithin turns up, she goes, here, carry this. <laughs> and Nithin just carries it the whole way. And I was thinking about, you know, today I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the divine exchange of the cross. Every sickness, every disease, every depression, every sorrow, every pain, every famine, every shortage. When our husband turns up, we can hand it over to him. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I just want you to right now give him whatever you need to hand it over to him. Some of you, only Daniel's like really seriously handing it over. <laughs> Take your hands and give it to him. Whatever sickness, give it to him. Whatever worry, give it to him. Anxiety is not our portion. Depression is not our portion, okay? Health is our portion, you know? Uh, sufficiency is our portion. Joy is our portion. So anything that isn't our portion, give it away. Give it away. Praise the Lord. Um, we, um, today we've got one of my friends uh, from uh, Aberdeen here. So Phil is going to be sharing the message today. And I... I'm so glad you're here, Phil. Bless you. Um, I'm going to introduce Phil, but I want to take the offering today. Um, I, I re rarely get an opportunity, but I'm going to take it. And I want you to turn your Bibles to the, the book of Malachi, um, or as we would say, Malachi, which is the right way to say it. And it says um, Malachi 3, verse 6. I'm going to go through this quickly. Hallelujah. I also felt, uh, Robin, I don't know. So in my head, um, Phil and I are the same height, right? Okay. Um, Phil sitting down and me are the same height. <laughs> but when we were having like the sound and the worship team, I was thinking Phil is closer to these speakers <laughs> than I am. So his, what he's hearing is way different from me. <laughs> It's God. <laughs> so I just realized a lot of things uh, just walking with Phil yesterday. So, uh, <laughs> so praise God. Malachi 3, 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me. Even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. That, you may be, that there may be food in my home. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I, I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for... You in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all nations shall call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Now, when I first came to the Lord, um, I, I came, out, came to the Lord in India, and we, I came from a Catholic background, and everything that we gave was used to make a sound, because it was basically coins. It go into the offering bowels and there's a jingle, you know. That's where jingle bells came from, you know. It was like you just put it in and go, you know. And then I came to the Lord and I realized when I read, when I write, read the Gospels, when I read um, 
you know, the acts of the apostles that God expected us to give and give well. The only place that God says to test us on, on something is, on, him on something, is here. Is it when it comes to offering and tithes? And there's a lot of, uh, especially in the Western world, uh, especially in Europe, or maybe in the UK, I don't know, that people don't like to talk about tithes and offerings. But I like to. The reason is I like to see people blessed. It says, the word of the Lord says that he will take care of the devourer. He will make your fields prosperous. And he will bless you in your giving. Test me on this. And as someone who's tested the Lord on this, I can tell you he has won the test. Jesus be the winner man when it comes to this. So I'm going to explain to you a bit of tithing as quick as I can. So, So I have a lot of resource, cookies and foxes. And Taryn is my best friend. By the way, can we give it up for the world's best actor? And because Taryn is my best friend, I'm going to give him all the cookies. All the cookies. Take all, there you go. All the cookies. Take all the cookies. And Taryn, really love you unconditionally. Have all the cookies, son. Have every cookie. But then I also like Anna. Anna. So I'm going to give her all the sweets. Oh, my gosh. Here's all the sweets, Anna. Jerry, I can, I'll give you the cup to collect more offering. <laughs> so now look at them. They're blessed. They have all the cookies. How many of you want to be Taryn's friend? How many of you want to be Anna's friend? But I have a condition I'm giving. I, of the 10 cookies, one is mine. Can I have one? Okay. Of the sweets, one is mine. Can I have one? So this is mine. Is any of this mine? 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 Of this mine? Turn your Bible to Psalm 24 verse 1. So everything is, so is this mine? Is this mine? See, now, Jerry, come here. I don't, you can, yeah, bring your cup. Bring your cup, Jerry. Bring your cup, Jerry. So now Jerry's coming here. And Jerry, ask me for something. You want cookies? Yeah, how many cookies do you want, Jerry? All of them. You want all of them? <laughs> I didn't have breakfast today. You didn't have breakfast today? I didn't. No. What, what do you need all of them for? To eat. So now, can you go ask Taryn for the cookies? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Jerry. I don't know. Um, I'm hungry. All right, you can have one. You can have one. Okay, there thank you. you. That's, that's all right. So... So now, this is, do you want any? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, are you, what is your feelings right now? I Please really don't ask. No, yeah, I really want some mints. <laughs> you don't want to, you don't want to share? Maybe your breath smells a bit. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! Rude! <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Jitlin, do you, are you hungry? Like, do you need anything? Yeah? So, come, come. Come, Jitlin. Okay? 
What do you, what do you want, Jethan? <laughs> All of them. So you, wanna, you need to feed your, your family and your friends, right? Yeah, so I need four. <laughs> <laughs> the max I can do is two. That, that's, that's the highest I can go. So now the thing is this. So can you give him four? As you give him four, I start giving you more. Okay? I start, you start giving, and I start giving more. As you start giving, you start getting more. Because the Lord says, test him. Test him on giving. We don't have because we don't give. That's Malachi 3. Amen. <laughs> See, God is looking not for a bank, banking of talent. God is looking for a giving because he gives. So many people do come and ask me this question. Do we tithe before or after taxes? Or do we tithe only 10%? They come and tell me that the 10% is Old Testament. But I'll tell you something. Lovers, I mean, Rachel said it. Lovers are givers. And so in the body of Christ, we are called to, to bring your offering. The giving of the, ten, the first cookie or the first uh, sweet, the 10% is not giving. That actually belonged to God anyway. So when you tithe, you haven't given anything. You're just returning to God that which is his. The offering comes after that. So what is your tithe percentage? I leave it to you. What is your offering? I leave it to you. I don't need cookies or sweets. Because my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. But I'll tell you something. Bring it to his house. That's what the word of the Lord says here. So that's my teaching. We have given, made it easy for you to give so that you can be blessed. There's the fivefold ministry and there are five ways to give. <laughs> you can give through cash. You can give through um, direct transfer. You can give through one of our apps. You can, um, you know, you can give online, you know, and uh, some of you are giving in faith. He gives seed to the sower and bread for life. So sow, receive your seed and have bread for life. That's, um, there, I know I'm being glib about this topic, but I'm going to encourage everybody to give. Because I want to see what the Lord can do. So right now, Father, I just lift up every person who's hearing my voice, Father. As we study on the book of Malachi, Father, may we understand your heart in asking us to give. May we understand that you're asking us to make you our source, our provision, and our supply. And may we understand that we're called to be stewards of the wealth that you've given us so that we can give to others that which you've placed into our hands, Father. Father, we thank you that you've trusted us with so much. May we steward well that which you've given us. And every person who's giving right now, Father, may they be blessed. Give them seed, more seed to sow. And give them bread for life. In Jesus' name, amen. Such a quiet church. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to give. Um, and do we, we, you can come and drop in uh, the for ushers. Uh, I think we may just lead a song. Um, as we're giving, because we became, they became really quiet, Rachel. I don't understand. It's just, I think everyone's just stunned at how tall I am. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> Praise the Lord. Let's worship him as we're giving. opportunity to give to you father you creator of all all things give us an opportunity to give back that which you've given father bless our hands bless every hand that is given in Jesus name I pray amen amen praise God hallelujah so um, we have a gift today with us. Phil Sanderson is a gift to the body of Christ. He's a senior pastor, lead pastor of, lead pastor? The only pastor of the River Church in Aberdeen. Uh, uh, <laughs> Phil and his wife Toto, they, um, you pastor the church and Phil's got three beautiful kids. Phil is also um, he is heading the British House Council of Prophets now. So he's the, lead, uh, you know, um, and doing an amazing job. Phil is un, unusual in that he's not only a, such a strong prophet, he's one of the best teachers of the word. So we have a privilege, um, and I'm telling you now, rec either record it, go back, because he's going to drop gems upon gems upon gems. So I want you to all stand up and honor the treasure and the gift that is Phil Sanderson. Okay, well, gosh, what a joy to be here. What a joy it is to be with you. Um, do you know, uh, Preeti was telling me that she identifies as being tall, uh, which, which is great because I identify as being a small Indian lady, so that, that all works out. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't get to self-identify. God gives us our identity. Otherwise, we'd be in a whole lot of trouble. Um, I bring greetings from River Church, Aberdeen. Uh, I was saying to Preeti that uh, uh, it's nice to be in a place and just feel the same spirit, that uh, what you're doing is what we're doing, doing, only you're a wee bit more mature than where we're at. You know, we're like a nice 12-year-old single malt whiskey. Uh, you guys are like the 15-year-old, except with all the messing up people's life part. That, that comes along with it. But so there's, there's, there's good stuff at work as well. Um, we are in Isaiah 6, I believe. I asked Jeevan, Jeevan, what are we doing? What is it you want me to preach on? He says, well, we're going through Isaiah 6. And I'm like, right, okay, that's enough. I can, I can do with that. We can, we can run with this uh, this morning. So I'm excited. I'm excited for God's word. I'm excited for God's people. I'm excited for the presence of God and the spirit of God. I'm excited about what Jesus is going to do this morning. And I pray that we get transformed through his word as it's empowered by Holy Spirit. Amen. Because God doesn't just want us to come in and just sit in church and fill some seats and fill some pews. He wants to transform us, right? He wants to renew us. He wants to move us from glory to ever-increasing glory. 
And God is on the move. Amen. He is doing something wild in these days. And it's a privilege to be here. It's a privilege to be part of what God wants to do. Amen. All righty. Okay, so Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. With two he flew. And he, with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and he said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. All right. So Lord Jesus, help us to understand what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. I need to put on my timer here, or else I'll go for hours. And also, I can't see the clock at the back because of the light. But so this is for your benefit that I'm doing this. By the way, I just it's... okay. Let's see. In the year that King Uzziah died. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, seated upon a throne. And the train of his robe filled the temple. I'm not sure if you felt it, but at the beginning of the year, there was a major shift in the spirit. There was a major shift in the spirit and it felt like we were on this this, this seesaw and the seesaw had a fulcrum and it was, we've been teeter tottering on the edge of of something for a long time and it, it feels like it's starting to go down on the other side now. It feels like there's a shift in the spirit because I think that the last four or five years since COVID has really been about the deconstruction of the church about how God has been challenging things, how he's been shaping things, how he's been saying, listen, you know what? Some of the stuff you're doing, I'm not best pleased with. Some of the stuff that's going on needs to change. Some of the stuff that's happening, it it isn't good for you. And so he's tearing things down. And he's leaving these foundations. But what I felt happened at the turn of the year was that there was a move from a time of deconstruction to let's start building. From a time of let's tear this down to let's build this up. And God is doing something where he's building his church. And Jesus is building his church. And the sound is going out once again. The gates of hell shall not prevail. Because he is building something in these days that if we could get to grips with and if we could get hold of, it's going to be revolutionary. In May last year, Chris Larkin phones me and she says, Phil, I really feel that we're moving. We're moving from Antioch to Ephesus. And I thought to myself, that's a bit pointed, Chris, because I'm part of a movement called Antioch. (laughs) We're moving from Antioch to Ephesus. And as Paul had two and a half to three years in Ephesus, teaching in the school of Tyrannus that laid the foundation for the church that saw extraordinary miracles. The church that saw people in fear because people were trying to cast out demons and the demons were going, well, Paul we know of and Jesus we know, but who the heck are you? 
The church that saw so many people saved out of rampant occultism that they're burning $5 million worth of occultic material just to get free. The church that so impacted the world around it that the, the idol makers and the silversmiths were going, oh, we're freaking out. They're changing the economy. No one's coming to the temple of Diana. They're all getting saved. And she said, we've got two and a half to three years to lay the foundation for what God wants to do for the next 50. This is where we are at the moment. We're in this place of, of transition. We're in this place of moving from one day to another day. Did anyone ever see that movie, Jesus Revolution? So that movie, Jesus Revolution, I was watching it. I watched it in the cinema. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching this. And I cried three times in that movie. I cried whenever all the hippies were getting baptized. I loved that. They're all getting baptized and they're waking up and they're going, ah, praise Jesus. And I cried whenever the old elder crossed the aisle to go and sit with all the hippies. Because I'm like, yes, we need to pass generations. You can't just chuck out what God has done before. And then I cried in the end credits. The first two tears were tears of joy. The last tears were tears of sadness. Because I saw all these crusades and all these people and I thought, gosh, we've become mainstream. Gosh, we've lost our cutting edge. We're no longer pioneers. And what God has been doing is he's starting to address who we are. He's starting to address who we are as people, who we are as churches. Now, you're a forerunner church. You know that, right? You're a pioneer church. And what's happening in you is going to be what's happening in other churches three, four, five years down the line, just because of the grace upon the house. And we want to be in that place where we're pressing in to what God has for us. Amen? You that King Uzziah died, let me tell you a little bit about Uzziah. Uzziah was the longest reigning king in the history of Israel. Judah, I should say, sorry. He was the most successful king in Judah's history after the division of the two kingdoms. He reigned for 52 years. He was all that Isaiah knew. He was all that most of Israel knew. But he had a bit of pride. One of the things with Uzziah is Uzziah went into the temple and he wanted to offer incense. Something that was illegal for a king to do. Because under the old covenant, kings and priests are separated. He goes in, he offers the incense, and God strikes him down with leprosy. And so you have this leprous king, the most successful king in Judah's history. He's all that they've known, and he's died. And he lasted 52 years. Do you know something? The Jesus movement ended in 1972. Do the maths, that's 52 years ago. Really, we can say that part of the charismatic movement that has existed in the world over these last 50, 50 years has had its origin in, uh, in the Jesus movement. Now, if you know anything about Scripture, one of the things that you should know is that God works in cycles. And he tends to work in cycles of 50, right? It's part of the whole concept of Sabbath. So whenever the seventh day, what did God do? He rested. Then, after seven years, what do you do with the land? You let the land rest. Then seven times seven is 49, so keep up with your maths. Seven times seven is 49. And on the 50th year is the year of Jubilee. It's the year of the Lord's favor. It's the year where debts are forgiven, 
prisoners are set free. And if you're freaking out about prisoners being set free, it was mostly only debtors who were imprisoned because all the rest of them got stoned. So they're, they're, they're set free. God recalibrates everything. Jesus is our jubilee, right? He comes, he proclaims the year of the Lord's favor. And so King Uzziah, he died, and the, Isaiah is ministering in the temple, and God draws his attention from one king who is temporary, who is leprosy ridden, who is dead, to another king who is high and lifted up, who sits on his throne, who is eternal. You see, in the time of transition, in the time of movement, the first thing that we need to see is to get a revelation of who God is. I saw the Lord. He's sitting on his throne. What does that mean? That means he's king. He's Lord. He's God. He's in charge. He's the one who sets the agenda. He's the one who knows what he's doing. He's the one the angels are adoring. He's the one the seraphim are flying around. And he's seated on his throne. And in this time of transition, we will not move forward unless we get a vision of the kingship and the majesty of God. He is the king. He is the king. Jesus is king. I mean, it's the most basic confession for the Christian, right? If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you confess that he is Lord, you will be saved. That's our worldview. Jesus is Lord. He is Lord. And so God is is moving us. He's shifting us. On Thursday morning, I'm praying, and I'm praying for you guys, and I have this vision, and I see a map of the world. And on this map of the world, it was like on a, on a wooden board. And the outlines of the, 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 there were no nations in it, it was just, just the continents. Uh, the outlines were in white. And I saw the Lord take a nail and hammer it into London. And I saw him start to hammer different nails about the place, and I saw him take string. And he started to connect the nails one to another. And as he's connecting the nails, what's happening is there's this net that is being formed across the earth. And I really believe that what the Lord is saying to to Capstone, Capstone, you're an apostolic house. You know you're an apostolic house. You're moving as an apostolic house. But he's connecting you to other apostolic houses. Because the Lord wants to form this net. I think I heard somewhere that the kingdom of God's like a net, right? I think Jesus said that, didn't he? Because there's a harvest that's coming. There's a harvest that's coming, and what has gone before is not fit for purpose to carry what God wants to do. Such is the weight of what he's saying. Because the promise is that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea, right? We are back in Ireland, so I, uh, I'm from Ireland, by the way. Um, I once told a church in Houston that uh, I'm an Irish man who lives in Scotland, that that makes me 87% more mystical than most people. Um, the Americans love that sort of stuff. You're from Ireland? And you live in Scotland? Do you live in a castle? <laughs> <laughs> um, completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah. So, uh, so we're in Ireland. We're in Ireland at Christmas time, and uh, I'm going to my parents' church. My dad is a retired Presbyterian minister, so that's the. You grew up in a Catholic background. I grew up in a Presbyterian background. This is pretty hardcore. And uh, um, we're there, and I'm looking around. And this church of about 400 people, and my daughter, Zoe, who's only 12, she says to me, she says, Dad, this is the most diverse church I've ever been in. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She goes, 
There's every type of middle-aged white person in this church you can imagine. <laughs> and I realized that my daughter's the most ethnically diverse person in that church. My wife's from China. <laughs> but the point is that God is doing, new, doing something new. Now, what's he doing? He has purchased a people for himself from every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue. And he has caused them to be kings and priests to our God. And they will rule on the earth. You see, the kingdom church is a multi-ethnic church. The kingdom church takes people from every tribe, every nation, every language, every tongue. The kingdom church is not concerned about ethnic Togetherness is concerned about the culture of heaven. What we often say in our churches, we're multi-ethnic, but we're monoculture. The culture we have needs to be the culture of the kingdom. Because if I come in with my Irish culture, and there's great parts about my Irish culture, we love hospitality. We're a kindred spirit with you guys in this sense. If you went and visit my mom, it doesn't matter who you are, you would be having tea and buns coming out of, your, out of your ears within half an hour. Come on in for a cup of tea. Here, have a bun. Oh, go on, go on, go on. You will. <laughs> Anyone seen Father Ted? <laughs> I mean, it's literally like that, right? But you know something about us Irish? We're pig ignorant, stubborn people who like to fight. <laughs> Which whenever it's in the flesh... It's horrible, but whenever it's in the spirit, it's amazing. Me and my wife went to marriage counseling, and uh, the, 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 <laughs> just pour it all out here. Um, <laughs> and the marriage counselor said, you two are so stubborn with each other. You're like this, coming against each other. But it only take a little adjustment to go like this. And so we decide, you know what, rather than being stubborn with each other, let's be stubborn for each other. And suddenly Jesus came into the situation and he started to redeem our stubbornness. You see, God takes the weak things of the world in order to shame the wise, right? And God wants to take the things that the enemy meant for evil in your life and turn them for good. He wants to redeem because he's the God of all redemption, right? And so he's redeeming something on the inside of us. So we, we, we look at the past. We look at what God has done. We look at what has happened in the church. And we say, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done. But Lord, you're doing a redemptive thing where you're taking us into this new season. You're taking us into this new place. And he's moving us forward. But this middle point is, I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And if I'm seeing the Lord, and if I'm seeing his kingship, then I'm the one who needs to change. You see, thank you, Preeti. You see, Isaiah, he knew all about God. He'd already written five chapters of the Bible. That's, that's the I think there's 21 books of the Bible that only have five chapters or less in them. So he's doing pretty good at this point. But he sees the Lord and something change. But the revelation of who God is, it's not God as provider. It's not God as the one who heals. It's not Jehovah Rapha. It's not Jehovah Nisi. He's not seeing what God does. He's seeing who God is. You see, God is love, but he's not love, love, love. God is good, but he's not good, good, good. But you see, he is holy, holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. And the whole earth is filled with his glory. And we fast forward to Revelation 4, which is the throne room in eternity. And the cherubim are, are, are crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. The whole earth is filled with his glory. 
And they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. And the, 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 the elders of heaven are casting their crowns down on the ground. And they're saying, he's worthy, he's worthy, he's worthy. You see, this is what's going on in heaven. It's the continual declaration of the holiness of God. Because God is holy. That is who he is. But the problem that we have is we have no idea what holiness is. Because we think holiness and purity are the same thing. We think that holiness means not drinking, not smoking, not dating girls who have tattoos. <laughs> and that definition changes depending which generation you're in. Listen, let me tell you something. Holiness has nothing to do with morality, but everything to do with the presence. Whenever God tells Moses, take off your sandals because you're standing on a holy ground, what moral action did that ground do to deserve having the presence of God there? Or whenever he says to Moses, take off your sandals, you're standing on a holy ground, what was up with the ground? Why was the ground holy? The ground wasn't holy because it was just trying really, really hard to read its Bible. It wasn't holy because of its incredible prayer life. It was holy because of the presence of God. It was holy because of the presence of God. Now, purity flows from holiness. Purity flows from holiness. How many of you know that you can have someone who loves Jesus with all their heart, is encountering Jesus, but makes the odd mistake, and that person is more holy than the morally perfect person who never spends any time with the Lord. Holiness is about proximity to the presence. How close are you to Jesus? Purity follows. Purity is the fruit, it's not the root. And so God is there and the seraphim are crying, holy, 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 and they're really saying different, separate. He's different. He's not you. How many of you are glad that God isn't you, right? <laughs> and the train of his robe, it fills the temple. And the Hebrew there says it keeps on filling the temple and keeps on filling the temple. The word for train there is the word hem. The hem of his garment. There's always a place for you to touch Amen. so that you can get healed. Amen. And a train of his robe had filled the temple. And Paul says this, and you've got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. So what's God doing? Isaiah has died. Isaiah is being called. And he's getting a vision of the king of glory. And they're crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is king he is high and lifted up. He sits on the throne. He fills the temple. And the heavenly realms declare his holiness. Kind of sounds like good church, doesn't it? So, where are we headed? Well, I've got six things that I want to say about where I think we're headed. And at the sound of music... And Julie Andrews has taught us anything. <laughs> it's that we should start at the very beginning. Because <laughs> it's a very good place to start, right? Yeah. Do you know this is my favorite verse in the Bible, by the way? I came in here, I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. In the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and the earth is formless and void. 
and the Spirit of the Lord is hovering over the surface of the deep. And God says, let there be light. You see, you've got God the Father. He's, he's creating the heavens and the earth and they're formless and they're void. You see, God, whenever he does a work, he does a work. Whenever he does a work, he doesn't, he doesn't just go, bing, there you are, the finished product. He's like, look, let's, let's move this thing. Let's shape this thing. Let's take some clay and make a pot out of it. Let's show some artistry because he's eternally creative, right? And so the earth is formless and it's void and there's darkness over the surface of the earth and the Holy Spirit's hovering over the deep. And it's like Holy Spirit going, Father, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are we doing? Where are we going? What are we going to make? What are we going to do? Let's hover. Let's hover over the deep. Let's bring some form into this formlessness. And God says, let there be light. The word of the Lord goes forth. See, this is why John starts his, his uh, gospel in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. So it's not just a voice that's going forth, it's a person that's going forth, right? And he, he separates light from day. He says, let there be light and there's night and there's day. And he says, that's good. The word there is tov, right? It's, it's, it's good. It's wholesome. It's, it's, it's like whenever your mum made cookies when you were younger, Right? And you're like, everything that is good about this, you know, it's like my wife says to the kid, Mom, this tastes so good. What's your secret? Secret ingredient is, it's love. <laughs> right? Every mother, you know what I'm talking about? No, it's not, it's MSG, but that's okay. <laughs> and he says, it's good. And then day two, that's good as well. Day three, the word of the Lord comes, and it's good. Day four, the word of the Lord comes and it's good. Day five, the word of the Lord comes and it's good. Day six, he makes man. He makes man in our image. In our image, he makes him, he says. And it's very good. And then what happens in day seven? He rests. Sabbath. You see, the manifestation of divine order is Sabbath. the manifestation of divine order in your life is Sabbath. Whenever the word of the Lord comes, and it comes to you, Rachel, and God says something amazing about you, and on the inside you readjust as the formlessness starts to gather form and you start to get made more and more into the image of Christ, then Sabbath starts to come in. And here's the thing about Sabbath. Sabbath is not not working. Jesus tells the Pharisees about this, right? They're like, you're breaking the Sabbath. And he's this, and Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And by the way, my father's always been at work. And the Pharisees are like, oh, you said God's your father. Pharisees got upset about a lot of things, didn't they? Gosh, Pharisees are everywhere. Do you think Pharisees would be on Twitter? <laughs> or X? <laughs> and so the manifestation, the manifestation of God's order is Sabbath. It's not not working, it's not toiling. It's not toiling. And so man, he's, he's with the Lord. And what's the first thing that God does after Sabbath or in Sabbath? He plants a garden. He plants a garden. And he says, Adam, you take dominion, you expand the, the garden, you subdue the earth, you, you take care of it. Do you know what dominion looked like for Adam? It looked like gardening. That's what dominion is supposed to look like for us. Actually, the same word that's used for dominion is used in Psalm 110, where it says, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your enemies are coming at you. It's time to do some gardening. Time to nurture some stuff and plant some seed. 
Time to water some seeds. Time to see stuff grow that's fruitful. And so Adam's is this, this gardener, which, by the way, is why Mary mistakes Jesus for a gardener after the resurrection. It's not like she's got teary eyes or anything. John's making a point about his Christology there. And so the garden then becomes this place of habitation for man. But the garden's more than a garden because the garden's also a mountain. I'm not sure if you knew that. It tells us that in Ezekiel 28, that the garden is also a mountain. It's a place of divine rulership. And see, this is the thing. Whenever we're in a place of Sabbath, whenever the word of the Lord has been spoken into us, God forms a garden on the inside of us, and that garden then becomes the place where he rules from in our lives. And God's desire is to turn the church from a field to a garden. So the first thing I want to say to you this morning, that God is moving us from toil to Sabbath. From working, 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 working till we're burnt out to working from a place of rest. From trying to perform in order to please God. God, if I just pray more, if I just read my Bible more, if I just speak in tongues more, to recognizing, Jesus, you love me, so I'm going to pray. I'm living in you, Lord, so I'm going to read my Bible because I love it. I'm going to speak in tongues more than all you all, as Paul said in the, the Texas translation. Um, okay, so number one, he's moving us from toil to Sabbath. Number two, he's moving us from congregation to ecclesia. He's moving us from gathering on a Sunday morning and saying we're just having church to recognizing what this cosmic purpose for the bride of Christ is. See, some of you don't realize it this morning, but you got up this morning, you had a shower, you had some breakfast, you stumbled into church, and all of a sudden you became part of a cosmic entity. All of a sudden, you became part of the temple of the living God. All of a sudden, you became part of the cosmic bride of Christ. All of a sudden, you became part of something that is supernatural in its very DNA. You see, whenever King James was talking about getting the Bible translated, he, I mean, I had to tell someone this week that King James himself didn't actually translate the Bible. All right? <laughs> I mean, he did some Bible translation. He was quite a smart guy, but he was, he was known in the 17th century as Britain's wisest fool, okay? So he, was a, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't a great dude. But he's uh, uh, the Bible translators, they get around, and they come to this word for the church, Ecclesia, and, and they're like, well, hold on a second. This is a problem because this makes the church too powerful. Let's change the word to kirikos. That means congregation. So that's just gathering. See, what's the Ecclesia? So, so in ancient Athens, you had, uh, if you were free, and if you were a dude, and if you owned some land, you could be part of the Democratos. The Democratos was the, the ruling body. There's about three or 4,000 of them. They would go up to the Areopagus. They would, they would chat. They would debate. They would work things out. And, and it, it, was, it was fine if you wanted to chat, but if you wanted to do anything, it was awful. Too many voices. The Democratos is where we get the word democracy from, by the way. And so in times of war or crisis, what would happen would be that the Democratos would suspend its power and it would call out individuals, gathered people, called out people, maybe about 200 of them of the, the, the most strategically minded of their number. And they would transfer all the power of the Democratos onto this group of called out ones. And they would make the decisions and they would be the legislative council. They would be the government. That group was called the Ecclesia. You see, church is not just a congregation of people gathering. Church is God's legislative body on earth. 
Church is not just you rocking up, meeting some friends, singing a few songs, listening to some scripture, going home and having your lunch. Church is the mystical bride of Christ, the people of God, the temple of God, the embassy of the kingdom of God on earth as God rules through his people. See, this is why the church needs to be a garden and not a field. Because the garden is a place of divine rulership, right? It's the place of resurrection. It's the place of the surrendering of the will that says, not my will, but your will be done. This here, do you know what this looks like? It looks like a garden. It looks like a garden. Revelation 21, God makes new heavens and new earth. Uh, and there's no more sea. There's no more sea because there's no more chaos. Sea is a metaphor for chaos in the Bible. And, and uh, it says that God has dwelt. He tabernacles with his people. See, Jesus was a manual God with us, but he was God with us self-limited. Limited to space, limited to time, limited to suffering, all that kind of stuff. This is God with us, unlimited, in his fullness. And what it looks like is there's a throne. And from the throne, there's a river. And the river is as clear as crystal. And it's a river, the water of life. And beside the river is the tree of life. By the way, the tree of life is a vine. Just so you know, that's, what grew, that's why it's growing alongside each side of the river because it's a vine. Jesus says, I'm the vine, right? So there's, there's this whole tree of life stuff in there. And it bears fruit, and it bears fruit continually. And its leaves are for what? The healing of the nations. You see, there's a river that flows from the throne of God. And what happens is, is that whenever we worship him, he's what? He's enthroned on the praises of his people. And whenever we are praising him, his throne rocks up and there's a river that flows. There's a river that flows from him, but there's a river that flows from you. Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he was meaning the Holy Spirit. And the river of God in you joins with the river of God flowing from the throne. And all of a sudden, not only are the angels singing, holy, 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 But we are singing holy, holy, holy because there's such a connectivity between heaven and earth in our worship. As we see the river of God flow and then it flows out of the threshold of the temple. Gosh, we're only toe dipping at the moment. So we're going from toil to Sabbath from congregation to ecclesia, from understanding Jesus as our most special guest to him being the host. Do you know what happens if we make Jesus our most special guest? We start using words like excellence. Anyone ever use that word? Let's do things with excellence. Can I just tell you something? The spirit of performance has been masquerading as excellence in the body of Christ for the last 20 years. Hmm. Because you know what it's like whenever you have guests come around? You want to put on a good impression. But that good impression is not what life's really like. You want to fluff the cushions whenever the cushions are mostly on the floor the rest of the time. (laughs) You want to make sure the dining room table is clean whenever it's normally covered in children's homework. You see, what happens then is we start putting on an act. We start performing. We start turning up to church and we're wearing our suits, we're wearing our ties and we're saying, look at this version of me that actually everyone knows is 100 miles away from the real version of you, but you, you just put it on anyway. Because after all, isn't Jesus our most honored guest? Can I just say something? I'm going to anyway. 
Somewhere down the line, Jesus thought, it's my house. I'm not the guest. You're the guest. I'm the host. So if he's the host, guess what? Our worship needs to change. Guess what? Our attitude needs to change. We're not doing things under the spirit of performance anymore. We're doing stuff under his grace and his mercy. And all of a sudden, our worship dynamic changes. And our worship dynamic changes from who can have the most polished set piece to let's give the prophets the microphone. Let's get the anointings that hear what Jesus is saying and bring them up to actually engage with worship. Let's get worship leaders. Let's teach them how to listen to the Spirit of God at what He's saying and actually start changing how they're singing to come into alignment with where the river's flowing on that day. Then what happens, new songs start spontaneously coming forth. New sounds start coming forth. And the seraphim cry, holy, holy, holy. So he's moving us. He's moving us from toil to Sabbath. He's moving us from congregation to ecclesia. He's moving us from guest to host. He's moving us from converts to disciples. William Carey, the father of the modern missionary movement, said that the Great Commission is true for all people at all times. Mission's important. We do mission. We need to go tell people the gospel, right? You know, Jesus said that the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed across the whole earth to every nation, and then the end will come. Do you know how I know that Jesus isn't coming back tomorrow? Because the gospel hasn't been preached to every people group and because the bride hasn't made herself ready yet. In some churches I could never say something like that. But what we did is we defined ourselves as being evangelical. We said we're evangelical Christians. We believe in the gospel. We believe in spreading the gospel. And what happened, and it was a necessary adjustment to liberal theology that was coming in at the time. And what we started to do, we started to define ourselves according to the greatest good of evangelicalism. And the highest anointing you can reach in evangelicalism is what? The evangelist. And so we started to say, yes, evangelists are the model. And we love evangelists, don't we? But evangelists are mostly concerned about getting people saved. Yeah, I've noticed something about evangelists. If you're an unbeliever, you're the most important person in the world to them. The moment you get saved, you're somebody else's problem. But you see, that's part of the anointing, right? That's the anointing they carry. Because evangelists aren't supposed to be alone. And neither are prophets or apostles, by the way. And so what happened in the church is because we defined ourselves according to being evangelical, we made lots of converts, but we made hardly any disciples. Holy Spirit did a lot of the teaching himself, right? How many of you gone, uh, actually, Holy Spirit was my teacher for the most part, yeah? And then we started calling ourselves evangelical charismatic, which meant that we wanted to see people get saved, but we wanted them to have gifts as well. The word charismatic means gifted, right? Charisma. You see, the problem is that what we did by calling ourselves evangelical charismatic 
was that we made ourselves be those that make converts and then use people according to their gifts and they ended up getting burnt out because they were just using their gifts and never walking in their calling. We said, you're good at administration. So you look after all the administration in the church and they're going, but I'm a pastor. What makes me come alive is, is letting people know that they're loved. Or we said to someone, hey, listen, I see that you've got the gift of mending the church boiler. <laughs> and we started doing ridiculous things, like calling them pastors just because they had responsibility in a particular sphere. I've got a lady in the church, uh, she's from Zimbabwe, she's hilarious, and um, I says to her one day, I says, Nama, I'm going to make you a pastor, and she goes, oh, fantastic, I'm like, you're going to be the pastor of putting out chairs, <laughs> and he's like, I don't care, it's a title, <laughs> she comes to me two weeks later, says, pastor, I don't want to put out chairs anymore, <laughs> I care, let's, let's do it together, right? See, God's moving us from converts to disciples, from gifts to calling. Who will go for us? Here I am. Send me. You see, if you know what your gift is, then you know what your purpose is. If you know what your purpose is and you're walking in your purpose, no matter what comes your way, you will not be burnt out because you will learn to be content in every situation. And God's moving us from evangelical charismatic churches to being kingdom churches. He's moving us from Christendom to kingdom. Do you know what Christendom does? Christendom says things like, oh, we're a Christian country. No, we're not. We never have been. We've had some laws that have been inspired by Christians. But you can't have a Christian country. You can have Christian people. In the year 331 AD, Emperor Constantine decided he was going to build a new capital. And in this capital, he wasn't going to have any pagan stuff, but actually what he did was he took the images of Zeus, he took the images of Apollo, and he Christianized them. And he gave Apollo a crown of thorns, and he put Zeus on a cross, and he said, that's what we're worshipping. And he decided that he was going to make a Christian city to be a capital over his Christian empire. And all of a sudden, all the pagans in the land were like, uh, what, we're Christian now? And all the bishops of the church are going, no, 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 you need to actually come to Jesus. You need to actually believe. But the emperor decided this was going to be the easiest way to govern the people. Now, here's the thing about Christian legislation. Christian legislation in government is good. It's good because it protects things. It's good because it puts into law freedoms that need to be protected. But legislation never changed anyone's heart. Law does not change hearts. God's grace changes hearts. Amen. And whenever we live in a Christendom mindset, we start freaking out whenever there's laws that make it difficult to be a Christian. Whereas what the Bible says, 
I count it pure joy, brothers. My wife, she's in Shanghai. She's from Shanghai. And uh, she, I mean, it's crazy, right? I always think, I was saying in Abin in the car today, if, if I was ever Spider-Man, I would move to Shanghai. <laughs> Just because of all the tall buildings, right? <laughs> and so she's there. To her, she has a city of 24 million people. My country, Northern Ireland, has 1.5 million people. So her city has 10, 15 times the population of my country, right? And so she's over there, and she was saying that she was, got, she was waiting for breakfast. She was at a college reunion, waiting for her friends to come down, and the security guard starts coming over and, and making small talk with her. And the security guard, his opening statement was, you know, I used to be in Chinese special forces. Now, every husband in here if some guy came up to his wife and said, hey, I used to be in special forces, you'd be going, that guy was hitting on you, right? She's like, no, no, no. That's, you know, he definitely was. And he starts talking all this stuff. And he says, you know something? We don't fear anything in the Chinese military. We don't fear the Russians. We don't fear the Americans. We don't fear the North Koreans. And then he stops and he says, actually, you know the only thing that we do fear? We fear the Christians. We fear the Christians because we don't know who they are, we don't know how many they are, and we don't know where their allegiance is. You see, you are a chosen people. You are a holy nation unto God. You are separate. You are different. You have a citizenship of a different place. And that place changes lives. See, God is moving us. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, sitting on his throne. The train of his robe filled the temple. And the cherubim and the seraphim were around him. And they cried, holy, holy, holy. It's the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Your job is to bring the glory of God to earth. Because one day, he's coming back. And our God will make his dwelling place with man. And God himself will be with them. And he will be their God and they will be his people. And he will wipe away every tear. But until that day, we've got a job to do. And our job is to be a kingdom of priests who reign on the earth and who are helping make his bride get ready. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you, Phil. I feel like I, I need to hear more. Uh, thank you so much. Um, Father, may we come into that season in this time of transition, understanding the rest God and the Ecclesia, Father. May we understand, Father. May we move into that which you're showing us, Father. Father, we thank you for Phil. Shall we just stretch out our hands towards? Father, we thank you for Phil and we thank you for Toto, Father. Father, we thank you for that which he carries, Father. 
And Father, we pray, Father, Lord, Lord, that you will increase the, the radius of his areas of influence, Father. Father, I pray, Father, Lord, that the truths within his spirit, Father, will be used to, Father, Lord, open doors, Lord, in nations, Father, for thy kingdom to come and thy will to be done, Father. So, Father, we bless Phil and his family, Father. We thank you for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Phil is with us next month, aren't you? Your so we have the mentoring program. Phil is here with us next May. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. I feel like I'm so happy you were here. Praise God. Let's give him a big God bless you. Come on. Um, Jeevan and Sari, you are back on Tuesday. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Um, Rakesh is traveling, so keep him in prayer. Um, he's in Kuwait, and um, tomorrow he goes to India. He is ministering in some places in India. Uh, but he's actually gone to see family. So they keep sending uh, videos of food and fun. Okay. <laughs> Um, um, and it was also, he went suddenly, I spoke to him about going and seeing his family. I went out, came back after an hour. He had booked the tickets <laughs> and he has left. So, uh, uh, and so, um, so keep him in prayer. Uh, and I think a lot of people are on holiday. So, um, so keep the, the family in prayer. I'm going to hand it over to, um, Sir George George. Oh. Oh, Hallelujah. prophetic act to remember the new covenant which was perfected on the cross for us so we walk into remembrance and Isaiah as he sang let's also sing take me into the holy of holies it's a time of presence of God. Touch my lips, here I am. Take me into the holy of holies. Take me in by the blood of the Lamb. Take me into the holy Hallelujah. 
the great redemptive the redemption plan was revealed through his prophets earlier on that's what we are remembering isn't it i'm i'm led to share from the book of ezekiel chapter 36 verse 22 onwards i do not do this for your sake but for my holy name's sake hallelujah which has been profaned among the nations and i will sanctify my great name which has been profaned among nations which you have profaned in your midst and the nations shall know that i am lord when i am hallowed in you before their eyes for i will take you from among the nations and gather you and bring you into your own land hallelujah whichever kingdoms we were captive to the kingdom of darkness the kingdoms of darkness through his redemption work on the cross he has gathered us into the kingdom of light through his blood and we remember that hallelujah and his name is hallowed through us his holy name is hallowed through us then i will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean i will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols i will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you hallelujah the cleansing the sprinkling of water which has been mentioned in hebrews and the new heart the guarantee of our redemption the deposit which is made in us through holy spirit i'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them then you shall dwell in the land i gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and i will be your god hallelujah remember what he has done for us he has gathered us back hallelujah by what he has done on the cross for us as we obey his commandments let us partake in in the holy communion i think the arrangement is that the elements are here and there is an order right pastor preeti is saying go in circles is that ah <laughs> uh, come from the outer ho- gate to to the in the court yes raba hira mashakala into the holy of holy take me in by the blood of the lamb take me in to the holy holy take the cold cleanse my lips here i am take the clean to the holy holy take me in by the blood of the lamb take me in to the holy holy take the cold cleanse my lips here i am Touch my lips here I am Therefore brethren having the boldness to enter the holiest blood of holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new living way which he consecrated for us <coughs> through the veil that is his flesh and having a high priest over the house of the god Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water 
Hallelujah. Praise Lord. Rahinia Shoramana Sikirinia. Let us partake. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took the bread in his hand, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take it. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake. The same manner he took the cup after covenant. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Ezekiel's prophecy after the cleansing of the heart, the prophet mentions or declares the Lord is going to restore, the Lord is going to rebuild the ruins. So there is going to be a building up, hallelujah. There is a restoration, hallelujah. And there is declaration of provision, there is a declaration of protection. As we have partaken, hallelujah, in the communion, hallelujah, in remembrance of what he has asked us to do. Thank you, Lord, for the body broken and the bloodshed through which we have life and life in fullness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hi. The greatest actor. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, church family. Uh, I'm here for announcements, not for acting. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, before I get to the announcements, is there anyone here for the first time? Could you give me a quick wave? Anyone here for the first time? Hi. Welcome. Welcome. Did, did I see a hand somewhere? Oh, sorry. Welcome. Welcome. Um, oh, and welcome you to, uh, both of you as well. It's, uh, we're blessed to have you all here at Capstone Church. Uh, church family, you saw their hands. Please go up and speak to them. Um, we'll hopefully have a new visitor form. I'd encourage you to fill this in. If you put your uh, details, a member of the church will connect with you. Uh, we also have uh, teas and coffees downstairs after service, so please join us for a time of fellowship as well. Um, so on to announcements. Uh, the first one is our Unite groups are resuming this week. So yes, yes. Um, I'd encourage everyone, um, please be, be part of a Unite group. If you're not part of a Unite group, please talk to our Unite group pastors, Matthew and Leah. They usually sit there. They're not here right now. But do go find them. You can, you can speak to uh, Eben as well, who's, who's not here. Or, is, oh, oh. <laughs> Uh, Ella, Ella, who's just raised her hands, you can speak to Ella if um, you're not part of a Unite group. Um, prayer and fasting, the church will be um, in, a, in a time of prayer and fasting from the 21st to the 27th of April. Um, so join us, there's going to be nightly meetings every day, that, every day next week. Uh, so do join us uh, for a time of prayer and fasting. Um, and... Uh, the Magnify Conference is happening in June. It's um, the 20th to the 22nd of June. Pastor Preeti spoke about it uh, last week. It's going to be focusing on the prophetic. It's going to be focusing on worship. I encourage you, church, do not miss out. You know, book your spots. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been blessed by every conference I've attended of this church, so I would really, really encourage everyone to sign up and not to miss out. Also, if you know people that would be interested in this church, do share information about the conference with them. Um, and finally, um, there's a, a mission trip being organized to Asia. Um, uh, if you would like to learn more about it, please speak to Virginia. Virginia, if you could give us a quick wave. Please do speak to Virginia about this, this opportunity, this mission trip that's happening in, in August. Um, that's all the announcements. Um, Pastor Preeti, if I can hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to, let's all stand up for the final blessing. Father, we just thank you, Father, that you've blessed us with so much. Father, we come before you, we 
offer you our lives. If there's anybody here, Father, that's not met you, Father, may they meet you today, Lord. And each one of us, may we go in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the love of our Father, in the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God. May each one be blessed.